the didgeridoo calls and you are all here. Thank you everybody for joining us all across the globe. If we want to consider something that interconnects us all and we can't live without, that would be water. And we throw a little bit of salt in it, you got yourself the ocean, which accounts for 70% of this earth. And as something that is feeding the biodiversity, cleaning our oxygen, and um, interacting with our land much more than you could have ever imagined. We brought in the world's expert, and I would say plastics uh, research pioneer in oceans, Marcus Erickson, to join us here on the podcast today to talk about data behind the research of analyzing our impact in the oceans with our waste and what that means for ocean biodiversity and the effects of humanity moving forward on our climate. So Marcus, thank you so much for coming in to uh, join us today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Glad to join you. So you build a raft out of junk. First of all, I appreciate the, uh, I, I do like to fly airplanes. So that body of the airplane on there looked <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. You know, <laughs> and, <laughs> you, uh, you have a great eye also for artwork. So your ability to repurpose things that people would otherwise see as waste and turn it into something meaningful that carries a message and can emotionally connect with someone, I think is fundamentally important and symbiotic to the research that you do, you know, because you do have a PhD around these statistical surveys within the ocean and the effects of our waste within that. So I want to kick it off to understand why is it the connection between art and the waste itself? What is that sort of attraction for you? Well, I think, first of all, I, I, I don't like throwing anything away. So okay. we just bought a, a farm um, uh, a few months ago. It comes to a 4,000 square foot little warehouse. And I packed it full of things because I have things in storage across the country. So I actually have two uh, Cessna uh, aircraft fuselages. One was the raft. Other is my daughter's clubhouse sitting in an avocado tree. So uh, the, the creativity, if, if we call it that, is I think like many people just being resourceful with the materials that you have. So making use of that, the raft mm-hmm. that you mentioned, the junk raft, that was our 2008, our first ocean voyage as an organization, uh, a Cessna 310 aircraft, 15,000 plastic bottles tucked into fishing nets under 26 sailboat masts right. cut and made into a, a deck. And we sailed from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Um, on this on this homemade homemade junk raft called junk, uh, but the relationship between art and and in this case adventure and science, really trying to uh, to communicate the uh, the issue of plastics, understanding that science by itself doesn't reach as vast an audience as as art might. Art reaches a much more general audience. So combining the two, we can reach a broader audience with our message. And in two thousand eight. The message was quite simple, just that there is trash in the oceans, it's abundant, and to also answer where is it, how much, and what the impact. So through art, through science, through adventure, right. we'll be able to tell that story. You know, when you think about, well, for most people, they've a lot of them have never seen the ocean. And to tell somebody that what they're doing on land thousands of miles away can have an impact on something completely unseen that could be quite dramatic to a biodiversity of life, that's sort of like a hard bridge or connection to make because you're essentially so disassociated geographically from the effect of your causes. So have you found that you know art as a medium in the book and the speaking that you've been doing is helping to bridge that awareness that we do live in this world of a closed system? And within this closed system, just because you don't see the effects firsthand right in front of you, and they are quite far away, what you are doing is having a decentralized effect for the positive or negative on life as a whole. Yes. So um, I would say all all those different uh, communications medium, the art, the science, the adventure, are vehicles to connect people to something that's very abstract and really Mm. unknown. Um, I've, I've given talks, you know, quite a bit to inland communities and frequently they will ask, you know, why would I care about the ocean? And one of the first things I say is that, well, your body, uh, is, is mimics the ocean concentration of water and salt. 
So you are an ocean within Correct. your body and your rivers, your streams all connect to the sea. We all, everything rolls downhill and the ocean is downhill from everywhere. So to make that connection, you know, there's another layer of this and that is the emotion behind it. You know, when I did that rafting voyage across the ocean, when I got halfway across, I remember I, I saw this fish and it's a fish I've been watching for almost a month and a half because I watched it being born. A uh, little thing called a rainbow runner. And when I first saw, there were 300 of them, yeah. about an inch long, yolk sac still attached. M- month and a half later, there were may- maybe five or six of them. And they were about a foot long. And we were out of food. And I fished one just for sustenance. And I made a video of opening its stomach because I saw this very taut, almond-shaped stomach. I touched with a fillet knife. It popped open and 17 particles of plastic popped out. And it was this this aha moment. I mean, it was it was disgusting at a core level. And that video, that photo, <laughs> gave so much attention, much more than any other image from that voyage. So there's an emotional connection to other life. And when, and when we talk about art, I've really been interested in. I've always been interested in the relationship between uh, humankind, human psychology, and and the biosphere. Humans have this connection to other life. When you see other life suffering, it draws you in. So in addition to adventure, science, and, and art, there's emotion, emotional connection to nature. So in the middle of the ocean, I find when you can connect people to the wildlife there, the kinship we have with other living things, and you, you really talk about the suffering, people pay attention instantly. For example, I just published a paper four months ago on plastic bags in the stomachs of camels. Um, I went back to Kuwait. Right. I'd been there back in 1991 when, in the first Gulf War. Went back there on a whole different mission to survey the Gulf of Arabia. And I met a veterinarian in Dubai said, well, come with me. Come see this. In the desert, we found five camel skeletons. Each had a mass of plastic trash, mostly plastic bags, in, in their gut, in their chest cavity. I pulled out one the size of a large suitcase, at least two to 3,000 plastic bags in this camel stomach. And when we described the suffering of these animals, went back to the hospital where this veterinarian did his work, and there was a camel, a dead camel lying there on the gurney with plastic trash in its gut, the emotional, the guttural emotional response, uh, in addition to, you know, I'd said the art, the science, and venture to show this emotional connection of the living things, it draws people in. So to connect folks to the ocean, I find connecting them to our kinship to wildlife is extremely powerful. That um, I I know that your relatives and where you are now. There's a lot of books, a lot of a uh, lot of literature behind you. Have you ever read okay. anything on Albert Schweitzer? I, I know the author, but I I have not. So I'm going to bridge a connection here. Some time ago, he wrote a book called The Reverence for Life, and this same thought process that you're carrying right here is the same realization he had deep inside at that moment when he began to witness pain of animals and how that pain had a direct effect on himself. He realized that all life at that moment was interconnected, not only on the physical realm for him, but also a very emotional one. And by having a reverence for life itself, allows us to open up our perspective to how we want to view our interaction with nature as human beings because we are a part of nature. And you felt the pain emotionally, and this physically was the detriment of this living animal that didn't have to die. And it's almost like the choices we make as humanity are having these secondary and tertiary effects that are actually killing life. We're indirectly removing beautiful things from this planet that want to coexist with us, but we prevent that sort of coexistence. And I just, I love that sort of match. And that perspective that you are carrying is one that I hope as we as a collective of human beings evolve into in the future is having that sort of reverence for what is going on and realizing these greater systemic effects of the choices that we're making. Like it's a plastic bag. Yes, yes. And when I think about, you know, I, I mentioned I was a Gulf War veteran. Um, this is back in 1991. If you remember the burning oil wells 
But Correct. If you, if you were just a kid or weren't alive then, um, it's easy to find those images. I was there. I was in in a hole in the sand among burning oil wells, thinking about what are we doing? What is the what is the true cost to preserve our access to to fossil fuels and and secure the energy and chemistry we get from those? That's part of the big picture. So when you say a plastic bag, the chemistry of that comes from petroleum, from fossil fuels. And right. I don't think anybody can deny that we have been engaged in resource wars. It's been that's happened throughout history. So that's the that's the beginning of the cost. On the back end, what I study now is the 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 impact, ecological, social, um, economic impact of, of plastic trash in the environment. So that's the other side of things. When you put all those costs together, including the, the intangible suffering of other life due to our, 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 our hubris, our, our, our use of single-use plastics, you have to say, is that convenience of a plastic bag really worth it? The true cost from the beginning to the end. And the answer, I have not seen anyone that says yes. Everyone says flat out no, when you really lay it out that way. But I want to add, add one more thing about the conversation um, about the relationship to other life. I've been interested uh, uh, since grad school to present about that relationship. And there's one, one author, Edward O. Wilson, coined a term called biophilia, the affinity human ha- humans have for life and lifelike systems. And there are nine characteristics of biophilia. Right. There's one utilitarian biophilia, the exploitation of nature for, for material gain. That has been the dominant mm-hmm. relationship we've had with nature. What can we take from it? But the moralistic, the humanistic, um, um, the aesthetic uh, relationships, kinship, all these other relationships take a backseat to the exploitive utilitarian relationship to nature. So I think what I heard as, as, you, as you, were, you were speaking was expanding our, our, our horizons to understand the, the value of that relationship and all of those other characteristics that uh, is, is essential yeah. to our, our valuing nature going forward. Because, for instance, if I, you know, we have you know, Jason's here on the other side of the table. If I ignore the relationship of him being in the room, I'm losing out on a lot of data. And essentially, I create this biasy in what I think is my reality here, when in fact, it's not true. I do have another human being here that is in this interaction of this conversation. And if I don't receive the input of something that is a part of this system, then I go around assuming I have all the facts, but really, it could be great emotional detriment because maybe I want to completely ignore Jason and think that he's of no value or that this conversation is just for me to feed my ego and I want to take, 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 take. And that's probably that utilitarian, you know, biophilia that you were speaking of where I just want to manipulate nature or my surroundings around me strictly for my sole material benefit. And these are, it's not so much the the petroleum industry that has the problem. It's our choice, I think, collectively to support that industry through our behaviors and the fact that we are not coming together collectively to say that this is something we do not want anymore and we choose not to use it. The only reason they continue to perpetuate these things is because we afford them the opportunity to do so. And just because something's cheap and easy doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And if, how could, Jason, we've talked about this, fossil fuels, right? They're dead things. <laughs> They've created from an anaerobic process. And then we're burning something that's anaerobic to create it as a fuel source or refine it into other goods, which we're using. So we're using dead things to create more dead things to hold our material things in. That, that sort of process doesn't seem like a self-sustaining system just in itself, right? That whole just from point A to point B, like that doesn't work. So when we look for options, new options, and we start to look at this data, and I understand that when you did your research study of these gears in the ocean, they're called gears, right? Gyres. Gyres. Yeah, gyres, like a gyroscope. These gyres, these swirling you know, thermal pools of water that are moving through these currents, 75.4% of it is macroplastic. Could you define what macroplastic is? 
Um, it's actually based on just uh, size differences. So you can, if you begin with microplastic, um, that's anything from um, uh, from a couple hundred microns to five millimeters. Mm-hmm. Then five millimeters to the size of a water bottle is is uh, meso. You get above that up to a beach ball size is macro. Bigger than that is mega. And there are folks talking about uh, giga, giga plastics being things the size of consolidated landfills. Then you go down even smaller to nano and pico and then the smaller ranges. So macro plastic simply means anything bigger than a, a, a lentil. That's sort of the macro, meso macro yeah. range. That's the big stuff. And that's where you can actually identify what things are. So when we published our paper uh, back in 2014, it was the first global estimate of all plastics of all sizes. We were trying to get some data to really understand what is the characterization of ocean ocean waste. And we found by far, first of all, 58% yeah. of the large macroplastic were, were fishing buoys. Large, thick, polyethylene, polypropylene, thick-walled spheres that keep nets afloat. They get lost uh, uh, from maritime right. activities all, all around. Next was 12% was, uh, uh, was fishing nets, and the rest were things you might find in maritime activities, bits of fishing line and rope um, and laundry detergent bottles, bleach bottles used to bleach and clean fishing decks. Another researcher, uh, Lauren LeBreton and his colleagues, in their macroplastic study in North Pacific alone, found 46% were just fishing nets. And you know that kind of data, it really narrows the conversation. I can't tell you how many times I've been in at conferences in the room with people and we're talking about plastic pollution. You got one person talking who's mm. really passionate about fishing gear, one person passionate about textiles, another person is about tires, car tires and tire crumb, another person is single use plastics. Okay. You get those folks in the room and we're talking about different polymers, different types of products and packaging, different inputs to the environment different environments where it resides, different impacts, uh, different outputs, and therefore a whole different solutions conversations. So what we're finding, and this is watching the data emerge over the last 15 years, 15, 20 years, is that this issue of plastic pollution is becoming specialized. It's, it's no longer just only oceans centric. It's we're looking at 13 different sectors of plastic use in society and thinking, okay, which environment might that go? When I say sectors, if you're interested in tires, where do tires, does tire crumb exist in the environment? And is there sufficient harm that warrants putting a lot of attention there right now? Or is it fishing gear? Where is the fishing gear? I don't see fishing gear in the desert or in the mountains. It's, it's almost only oceans. But how about things like textile, textile fibers? Well, we find those ubiquitous around the world, mm. but one point source might be effluent from treatment plants. So when we talk about these sectors, this is where the conversation is shifting right now. People are thinking for the upstream preventative solutions we want, it's got to be tailored per sector. So when we talk about, about oceans, it's the it's most of the fishing gear sector as you identified, and what's the preventative upstream solution we want for that, that maritime sector. And that's where data uh, is yeah. really well, helpful. Well, Marcus, you have a uh, you have a white paper, and I encourage everybody to go to your website because you have a lot of white papers on there. Um, and and one of them is says plastic pollution is ambiguous throughout the um, marine environment. Yeah, estimates the global abundance and weight of floating plastics have lacked data, particularly. So when you use, you use the words lack data, and then I know you just said ten or fifteen years, you guys are getting a lot of data. What does that look like? Is, is it just because there's awareness now? Um, and then um, this is kind of a two-part question with the data. And then number two, from what you're seeing now, to put into perspective, how many how many tons of plastic is in the ocean? You know, like so an average person could get this and understand the severity of it. Sure. And that's it's interesting you, you asked that question because that is uh, precisely what we're working on right now. That's one paper that we're, uh, we're hoping to submit soon is, is another global estimate. We did one back in 2014. And, and those numbers were 5.25 trillion particles uh, and estimated a quarter million tons. And that was based on, you know, getting as much data as we could, our own data. We had just surveyed each of the five subtropical gyres. And for example, North Pacific mm-hmm. is one gyre, North Atlantic is one, South Pacific, 
South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, these accumulation zones. Indian. We had yeah. that data and added data from a few other published sources. There wasn't much. We had under, under 3,000 data points, and we made that estimate. And that estimate was also based on ocean modeling studies, understanding how does a plastic bottle, bottle cap, or a fork, how does it move in those ocean currents? So we took our data and we could extrapolate to other parts of the world. But now this recent study, we're looking at a trend analysis. What if we take everything we knew back in 1975, 80, 85, 90, 95, and five-year increments and do another snapshot in time? What does that trend look like? What we're finding is that it's extremely difficult. We tried so many modeling efforts and statistical tricks to understand the trend. What we got was a very coarse trend, but a significant one that shows a very steady, steady, sort of stabilized up until the end of last uh, last century. In the last 15 years, a very drastic increase in the number of particles in the ocean surface. And with and our data set now is almost four times what we had six years ago. Tremendous amounts of data. So even though we can get resolution on the current snapshot, over time, there are such huge data gaps. But we got this trend analysis. And with this trend analysis, we were able to, to make another estimate uh, uh, for what there is right now. It's well over 100 uh, million tons right now, we estimate, floating in the world's oceans. The particle count, I haven't got that number just yet. We're still tweaking the model a bit. But t- simply, it's a whole lot more than we found uh, six years ago. And that's driven by an abundance of data. But what it also tells us, like I was mentioning before about these multiple sectors, is that the ocean going forward, we need to pull away from this being only an ocean-centric issue. Oceans are great if you're studying just mm-hmm. fishing gear and want to mitigate fishing gear. But the other sectors, if you're focused on tires and other things, e-waste, uh, uh, durable goods, you're not going to go to the ocean. You can look at other, other places in the environment where they might reside to try and find a solution for those. And that data is emerging as well. There was a great paper, a study we're involved in in San Francisco Bay, where they looked at just the bay. And they're looking at microplastics on the surface, in the water column, in sediment, near shore, offshore, in fish, in all these different places in the environment where it might reside. And we find we were surprised how much tire crumb was just, just offshore, actually just right along the shoreline where the effluent pipes were pouring from stormwater runoff into yeah. the bay full of tire crumb. So if you're going to study tires, that's the place to go right there or the roadside. So as more data comes in, we can get a better, better resolution, better tools to aid policymakers in their, in their efforts to find a preventative solution per sector. You had a second question. So, yeah, no, you answered both of them. Yeah, no, you, you was trying to essentially conceptualize the size and the weight of the waste for individuals to kind of like process that mental relationship. Now, when I, when I hear trends, uh, Marcus, I think lagging indicators, you guys see the damage after the fact, and then you're trying to analyze it. And if it's a human caused thing, I would want to know, I would want to go to like you, Marcus and say, Marcus, do you use plastic bags? How often from how many sources? How do you dispose of how many, through no fault of your own, happen to get carried away in the wind by accident and you could not retrieve? These would help, I would assume, with these data gaps that actually end up leading to what goes into the ocean. Or even asking the question, what is your consumption of fish that would be supporting the marine industry that may have these larger macroplastics, right? Or how often do you buy new tires, change your tires, drive your car on the road? Because these are leading indicators that would again drive to those specific sectors. And I think to close those gaps would be having those data conversations with individuals that are essentially the drivers of those systems of waste. And when I think about this all together, it's not really just plastic waste. It's the idea of how humanity is dealing with the waste that we create. Now, if I go into the forest, I have mycorrhiza and other fungus that sit on the floor and they essentially break down the detritus, like detritus we have in our oceans. You know this very well. And then from that, it feeds into the system, breaks down the nutrients, and that all gets perfectly recycled. 
you know, very symbiotic process and everybody's helping each other out. We as a species on this planet, as an organism, lack the ability in the, essentially the waste we are creating, whether, you know, if we're a tree creating sugars, right, that's waste, right? Or we're a human being creating plastic waste or anything else in the nature. We don't do a good job of either recycling it or turning it into something else that could be albeit beneficial. So that focus, I think, has to look at those behaviors to close that data gap and help us understand how it creates those trends and then how we can really change the direction of those trends going forward. Would that make sense? Yes. And those actually are some of the exact kinds of questions we're hearing um, um, policymakers and folks from the, from the public and private sector ask. As, as things shift from, you know, we're going to focus on downstream cleanup or upstream preventative mitigations. So where do you put your, where's the biggest bang for your buck? About plastic bags, are we gonna focus on cleaning up bags or look at, is there a way to, I mean, the biggest bang for your buck is always a preventative solution. And that, those are conversations now. So I, 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 I'd like to, to add that things are shifting away from people thinking, okay, the place in the environment where the trash exists Initially, 10, 15 years ago, the questions or the answers people were, were, were thinking was, well, someone go clean it up. Someone go do a downstream mitigation, clean up that trash, pick it up. And now we're seeing the trend and the kinds of questions being asked is, okay, what is the source? Where are the emissions happening? And what are the, the activities, the behaviors, the, the consumer culture, um, the economic structures that are making that waste in the first place? And you know that you mentioned sure. something really important about these biological cycles, and this is part of the the, the circular economic thinking that's uh, that's that's part of the the conversation today. So the biological circular economy is like you said: in the middle of forest, microrhizomes are are taking the detritus and putting it back into the system. That biological circular economy has been in existence since you know life has been on this planet. Then there's the technological circular economy, which we're not that good at. Then there's the third linear economy, mm. which is dominant. That linear economy, as we all know so well, we, we extract materials, we, we, we make raw materials from those, we, we then make products, and those get collected, um, they become waste, which if they, if they get collected as waste, they become landfill or incinerated. That they don't come back to the system. That's a linear yeah. economy. And the circular economy is where we are seeing right now so much innovation, entrepreneurship, trying to create that, that circular economy for technical materials. So, so, so like you were saying, the plastic bag doesn't fit in, in a technical circular economy. It's just too difficult to capture all the bags. They, they're, they're, they're the ultimate escape artists. And like I think you mentioned about in the desert, you put a bag in a in a bin in a desert community, it in five minutes it's gonna blow out and be gone. Mm -hmm. And I saw that when I went back to Kuwait. Yeah. There was one fence line, it was only plastic bags, and the fence was pushed down to the ground. So in that in that technical circular economy, we're seeing innovation in reuse economies, uh, repair, remanufacture. We're seeing design, uh, unfortunately it's all voluntary right now, but design innovation, designing for recovery. Like, for example, a, an office chair, you can take apart into 100 components and replace just ones that are broken. Uh, for me personally, uh, I embrace the, the reuse and repair. I'm always going to uh, um, uh, Craigslist or offer up and see what's available that I can repair. I'd rather let someone else have that, sure. spend money for the initial depreciation of the goods, and I'll buy it secondhand and fix it myself. So we're seeing those kinds of things happening. And I'll just uh, I'll offer one more example of the reuse economy that's thriving. We've seen companies that, for example, one company vessel has one single container, a mug, and they're getting every restaurant and coffee shop in one city to collect, wash, and give that cup back to customers. It's a, it's a localized reuse economy. Repack is a company that's making a reusable mailer that maybe UPS, FedEx, and Amazon may adopt in the future. Lots of innovation coming out there. So I actually feel more optimistic now than I have been in the last, uh, last decade. No, I think that's incredible. And, you know, we see that here, even locally in New Mexico, in Taos, New Mexico, we have these things called earth ships. 
where they use tires, they use bottles, and they build them into the land. And they find that through this recycling process, you can actually have something very efficiently made out of waste itself. You know, and those are, but that requires that change of mindset, change of attitude, and realize that a little bit extra effort can actually have, you know, really great impacts rather than just taking the easy, convenient way. And now when you think of convenience, for us, we're, we're, we're very creative, conscious thinking beings. But when you think about a fish, especially like one of those rainbow fish you were speaking of, their thought is survival. So the easiest, lowest energy cost food source that they think is available, and they have a hard time differentiating between a microplastic or actual like phytoplankton or whatever it might be, would cause great harm for them. And so because if they don't know any better and we know better, I would think that would be our responsibility to protect that life itself. Right? I couldn't agree more. Now, through that protection, if I want to protect it, I also want to understand what is the effect of that plastic on the fish itself. I understand that there are certain algaes and bioorganisms within the oceans that break down things that come from polycarbonates, even oil, for instance. So what is the systemic effect on the biological life of the oceans when a piece of plastic actually enters into a fish? Is this something cancerous or what happens down the line or actually primarily with that thing going through that ingestion itself? If you look at the impacts of uh, plastic waste on, on other life, um, and this is both terrestrial and in the ocean, and and. Let me use camels for an example. That's a charismatic right. megafauna. And I just, I just published a paper on those. And talking with Uli Werner, he was the veterinarian in Dubai that's been working on camels for 30 years. He built the hospital there in Dubai for camels only. Um, thinking about camels, and like the fish, all these organisms have known uh, in, in the desert, for example, if it's not sand, it's food. Food is so scarce. And they'll just right. forage on, on acacia trees. They'll pull leaves and anything off these trees, uh, it's always they always known it to be just food. And they're consuming plastics. Either it's it's litter that's intentionally tossed out, and and there has been evidence, a lot of evidence, of people camping in the desert, leaving their trash behind, things blowing out of bins, blowing out of landfills, um, and all the per, the perpetuation of single use plastics, creating lots of opportunities for plastics to escape. Um, the harm it might cause. When I talk with Uli Werner, and I thought about about the camels. These animals, they, they keep food in their gut. They're ruminants. They eat the plastic trash. They don't know any better. It sits in their gut. It creates mechanical uh, ailments, lacerations, ulcers on their bodies, which cause tremendous discomfort. If they bleed internally, it can cause death. If not, it creates this large, large mass. Now, it's common to have small masses in ruminants called a, called a bezoar. They're using calcified masses. They're small, and they're, and they're, they're fairly normal. But when you add plastics, we call them a polybezoar. That's a word we invented for these massive, large suitcase size, concreted mass of plastic trash. So the animals have this huge mass. I'm sorry, bed. suitcase size? What's that? As big as a it's large. The size of a suitcase, Marcus? Yes. I pulled one out of the camel's chest. That's that. That's- about maybe 50 pounds. Massive, massive thing. And you, you can imagine that being in your gut. I'm having a really... I'm sorry to interrupt, but sure, I'm like having a hard time even building that image in my mind. I, like I've seen a camel, but to say to pull a 50 pound block of plastic out of this thing is just the most absurd thing I could even imagine. Yes, and, and I'll, I'll share with you photos if you want to see these things. They're unbelievable. They're they're large, and, and you can imagine like imagine if you had 15 plastic bags, a dozen bottle caps in your stomach. The lacerations, the ulcers might form, but also you have a false sense of satiation. You feel like you're full when you're not, and you you may become malnourished, as the camels do. You become dehydrated, as the camels do. It can cause cause blockages. Uh, Twisting in the intestine, the plastic bags can cause. So the suffering is tremendous. So these animals, Uli Werner, uh, the veterinarian, has he's seen close to 300 camels come through his hospital. All of them died all with plastic trash in their gut. And we pulled five out of the desert. That became the focus of our, our research paper. We determined a 1% mortality rate for that local population. But that's suffering. I can't imagine 
dying of starvation when your stomach is distended or, ha- or, or having a, an internal bleeding from just trash lacerating your, your stomach lining. So I think of that. That goes back to the biophilia, that affinity we have for other life. It's, 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 it's gut-wrenching, no, no, no pun intended there, but it's, it's, it's emotionally horrible to think that this, because of one, a, a plastic bag is causing that much suffering on an entire yeah. population of organisms. It's unacceptable. You know, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize I'd be so bummed out talking to you and it's not your fault. You just, <laughs> you know, you're giving me all this information. I'm just like, well, damn. Then I, I would ask this then, Marcus, what should be our focus as an individual right now across 222 countries? What is the simplest change in our mindset that can prevent the effect on camels or other biodiversity across the world? What What is it we can do actionable right this second, material or immaterial, that could lead to a drastic benefit to change those trends? You know, I, I often get that question, what can the individual do? And of course, there's a long list of things that you personally can do if you have the resources right. to do it. Um, go as, as zero waste as possible. Zero waste your home, your office, um, uh, your school. And we see that trend happening. Um, but often I, I, I say, get organized. And when you get groups of people together, I've, I've met hundreds of school groups, uh, little eco clubs that have helped to have their school go zero waste, to switch. For example, one school in Los Angeles this is amazing. These kids were in such an uproar over the same conversation we're having that they convinced the principal to to let them take all the polystyrene foamed polystyrene food trays that they use in one week over well over a thousand trays. They punched a hole in the bottom, made this giant rectangular looking snake, and they hung it in the tree for two years. Until the, the the superintendent of school of, of LA Unified School District they got so much attention from this school that over a couple of years of campaigning, that superintendent said, "Okay, we're switching to paper to a to a, a renewable resource doesn't have the harmful effect." Over 900 schools went to a paper tray. This school not only saved their individual school 10 grand not buying styrofoam. They influenced the entire school. And within a couple of years later, uh, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, I think Dallas and Fort Lauderdale all collectively found a vendor that could sell a paper tray at the same cost or close to it of a styrofoam tray. And they all switched. They became a market driver for change beginning with kids, kids getting organized. So individuals organizing, and there are so many organizations out there from Surfrider, Heal the Bay, and others, help you get organized to, to help support policies, to become market drivers, to support the innovators, the entrepreneurs that are providing that renewable solution. So I think getting organized and, and, and using your market power, your political power as a group is what the individual can do. I do love that. And you've taken a leap no pun intended into something called leap lab. And it shows that what you are creating and educating individuals on, on these, these three farms and communities that you have is um, a process of zero waste in every aspect of how to live and maintain smaller, more localized communities. Is this, was this just a natural progression for you? through your research, through your art, through the realization that education and perspective and social psychology, it's important that we almost look at the habits and then you create these areas of example for people to live and learn in. Is that what, what this pro- progression was like? Yes. I, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, thinking about my life trajectory, but more importantly, the trends that I'm observing, the, the idea of globalizing ideas and not stuff, creating local mm-hmm. circular economies, but sharing information wildly is where I think uh, where I think we're headed. 
there's enough technology out there and enough will that I'm seeing emerge from the public that create local local circuit economies. Can we meet our basic needs and take care of each other within a small radius of where we live? And we're seeing examples happen very quickly. So the idea of Leap Lab was to promote that idea. So, so uh, right now, we just purchased a 15-acre property in, in Santa Paula. I used my VA loan to get this place. 15 acres. It has a 4,000-square-foot metal barn. Uh, thanks. And, and right now, it's packed full of fossils. I, I'm not sure I mentioned we've had a, a side hustle of collecting Lake Cretaceous dinosaurs in Wyoming for the last 30 years. So I've got eight partial triceratops skeletons <laughs> in the barn. If you, want, if you want to do this again and talk natural history, I'd love Send to. Send me one. <laughs> yeah, let's. I, you and I, let's go dig for fossils. You're bringing me back to childhood right now. I'm very excited. Hey, that's why we've got this hangar full of a triceratops skeletons. Kids love dinosaurs. They can come to this this farm and see these skeletons, and then we can say, oh, by the way, here's sustainability. Here's what local circular economies look like. Um, so we have 50 acres to plant to plant food. Um, we are as we're going as zero waste as possible. There's some infrastructure of of some of the, the, the irrigation lines and so forth are plastic. Um, but trying to go to zero waste, demonstrate, mm-hmm. demonstrate what a local circular economy looks like and also bring the joy of, of science and adventure and art uh, to, to, to this younger generation. Ventura County has 20 school districts, 140,000 kids that don't have easy access to the zoos, aquarium, science center, museum, natural history in LA or Santa Barbara. And we're hoping to bring that to them. But at the same time, I have to have this caveat. I'm not going in the community saying, here's what you need. We are actively working with uh, community leaders uh, and organizers in Ventura County to ask them, here's what we have to offer. What do you think fits? What fits with, um, with the school district's right. needs, the kids' needs? It's, we're doing this right now, and it is wonderful eye-opening a vertical learning curve for for all of us but it's the right thing to do it feels great i um i want to say first and foremost and jason i will agree with Mm -hmm. this thank you for respecting the free will of these communities and coming to them as a partner with an option and asking if they want to take the responsibility themselves and meeting them where they are not telling them where they should be that is so a important. fundamental difference of acceptance to someone's responsibility in a change that could be very positive for them. And I think that sort of attitude is one that needs to be reused over and over and over again for just about anything that we're looking at that is critical to our survival here on this planet. I think approaching it with a, with a, a tremendous humility and uh, and, and willingness to to just listen. I mean, uh, I'm fifty. I'm fifty four years old. The biggest thing I've learned in the last ten years is when to be quiet and listen. And mm. it's been one of the biggest, the greatest advantage for me in trying to reach the mission of our organization is to listen to your audience and let them tell you how it lands on them. If if they want to hear it, and perhaps what's missing, and you learn. And for example, where we are now in Ventura County. Uh, we're in Santa Paula, an agricultural community. I'm not about to assume that I that I understand what life is like in an agricultural community. Uh, I, I, I'm not the dominant dominant demographic. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a newcomer. I, I do understand as a science yeah. educator what the core curriculum is for science learning, but I'm I'm not about to assume that I know how that lands or or, or how to present that information to people. So listening. And hearing people are, and also hiring local people to be the spokespersons for these these issues to disseminate this knowledge is essential to uh, to our success. They're like the sat raps of Leap Lab. You don't just like inject your own people; you leave the ones there that understand the culture, and then elevate them within their own cultures to do what they need to do. And I think listening to others is just as important as listening to what the planet is telling us. And I'd like to say, Marcus. Um, we have the Big Seven initiative through our marketplace that affords donor access from 222 countries towards causes that want to list themselves in our market. And we would be more than happy to list Leap Lab to increase the amount of donation flow going into what you guys are doing because we, uh, we agree 
and we want to champion with that sort of perspective mindset and initiative that you guys are taking. So if, if you're up for it, uh, we'd be happy to have that conversation. That would be fantastic. We actually leave in a month to go to Wyoming to dig up another Triceratops skull. You have 30 oh, people and half and half are kids. Um, Listen, so I'll be, uh, I'll be in Wyoming in a month. So I'd be happy to uh, <laughs> come up there and meet you. You're, you're more than welcome. See what, what we do in the, an engagement with uh, uh, with youth from from across the country who come converge and, and learn science, hands on science in the context of being on a seven thousand acre ranch. Oh, it is that. a blast. If um, if somebody wants to find out more, whether it's about your research on the gyres of the ocean, micro macro mesoplastics, industry specific research, camels or zero waste farming and sustainable community operations, where would an individual go to do that? Um, I would say the, the, our two organizations, fivegyres.org, but also leaplab.org, uh, leaplab.org. That's where you can find me. Um, uh, you can find where to answer, where, where to submit questions. And I mean, feel free to reach out. I spend half my morning just responding to people uh, their inquiries. I think it's important to, uh, to not dismiss people. Uh, I love when people people come with questions, especially young people. So yeah, those two those two website links you can find me and feel free to reach out anytime. I uh, it's important to make myself available to uh, to engage with uh, with listeners. That's incredible. Well, listen, Marcus, thank you so much for coming on the Turtlecast. Uh, this has been monumentally helpful, enlightening, a great sharing of truths that need to be heard. And um, I think this leaves everybody with a nice firm footing for what we need to do to take action in the, in the future. Yes, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.